All right, so here we are on limits day two, um, even though we're on the third day of class. And uh, all right, we'll take a look at question 12 in a little bit, okay? Um, so starting off with sort of what we know, all right? By now, I hope we have a general sense of what it is to, uh, what a limit is, meaning that the biggest thing that we wanna consider is it doesn't matter what happens when we get to the point. It happen, It matters what happens when we get really close to the point, okay? Uh, you can almost think about it like, has anyone in here ever studied like really hard for a test? And then, you know, you put so much like blood, sweat and tears into studying and preparing for this test and you get into the test and you just, bomb the test. That ever happened to anyone? It certainly happened to me before. Yes. Okay. So I think, yeah, chemistry, right? I've heard chemistry is definitely a challenge. Pre-calc also, so much content. Um, but when we think about our experience, um, I think a lot of times we see our test grade and we're like, wow, that was a really bad test grade. We must not be very smart or I must not be very smart. And we sort of put that on ourselves and we don't really consider all that time that we put into it. Um, and I think when we think about limits in sort of a similar way, uh, limits actually are like challenging us to focus on what happens as we get really close to that moment and not necessarily what happens in that moment. Um, and so, um, some of the limits questions were saying, what happens when we get close to this point? There's not actually a point there. That's okay. We just really care about what the Y values are as we get really close to that, okay? So if that analogy kind of helps you think about a limit a little bit better, uh, that might be something you use to frame that. <clears throat> Um, we've looked at how to find limits graphically. I think that's something that for the most part, folks uh, seem to be grasping quite well, which is excellent. Um, and the algebraic part, we learned quite a few strategies yesterday. And so let's maybe highlight those here, that algebraically, uh, what's the first thing we always wanna try when we're thinking about finding a limit without a picture? Substitution. Substitution, you got it. So substitution always comes first. Because like many things, we don't really want to do more work than we need to. And if we can just plug in the number and it's all good, why do anything else fancier, okay? Now we talked about a few cases where maybe sometimes we needed to use factoring. Uh, can someone share uh, what a good clue might be about when you need to use factoring in a question? Uh, when there's like quadratics. Perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. Presence of a quadratic. I love it, right? And so maybe we remind ourselves it's like after we tried substitution, we got zero over zero. And then we tried the factoring, right? So we have factoring, we had conjugates. And conjugates was when we saw like sort of the inverse of a quadratic. We saw a lot of square roots. And so we, part of this was like, how do we get rid of the square root? We can get rid of those using conjugates. And then the last thing we finished off yesterday with was the idea of complex fractions. And I think that one was a little easier to see because if we saw fractions inside of fractions, then we know we needed to find common denominators and combine something, okay? So that's what we've covered in the last two days of class. But if we think about what's new, all right, the focus for this section is what is continuity? All right, so I think I mentioned before that there's a lot of vocabulary in calculus and part of mastering the content is being able to speak comfortably using these words um, or to write comfortably using these words. So knowing how we can define continuity, how it relates to limits. And we're gonna bring back a lot of trigonometry. Not a lot yet, but we're, we're gonna be using a lot of trigonometry. Okay, so I wanna put that out there as fair warning. 
Uh, I know for a lot of us, we took 141 and maybe 104 was like a while ago. So um, <clears throat> we'll have some assignments maybe next week that help us brush up on the trig a little bit. Uh, but I would encourage you if, uh, if you haven't seen your good old friend, the unit circle in a while, I would, I would find that friend again, maybe in the form of a PDF online or something like that, okay? But the unit circle will be very, very helpful for us to know uh, throughout this course, all right? So we're gonna sort of dip our toes in that, start to think about how we can apply trig and limits together, okay? All right, so that's where we're headed for today. And we're gonna go ahead and start with what is continuity, okay? So this is something that you all did yesterday, completing the limits and continuity activity on Desmos. And so I'm wondering before we move forward, what kind of uh, concepts folks might have come across there? In other words, what were some main takeaway points that you saw in the Desmos activity that you completed yesterday? And I know one person said- um, If uh, the- Y value at that value of X is not defined as the function is not continuous. Ah, okay. Uh, if Y value is undefined at an X value, the function is not continuous. At that, at that point, you know. At that point, yes, yes. F is not continuous at that. Love it. Okay, so if you are trying to find a y value at a point and you can't find one, then that means that the function is not continuous at that very point. All right, looks like we got some great things in the chat too. If the point coming from the left and the right and what the point actually is are all the same, then it is continuous. That is fabulous, I love that. Let's, let's get that down here. So um, if, and instead of saying the point coming from the left, I'm just gonna switch that a little bit to say the limit from the left, okay? So when we say the limit coming from the left, that I think that sort of captures the idea of that Y value from the left, okay? So if the, sometimes we even call that the, that's not how we say that, the left-hand limit. So if the left-hand limit the right hand limit and the actual y value at a point are all the same, then function is continuous. And we'll throw in that extra phrase at that point. Okay, so my morning chicken scratch, if the left-hand limit, the right-hand limit, and the actual y, that y value at a point are all the same, then the function is continuous at that point. I love that. Um. I have a question. Is this is this from what we covered in Math 141? It might have been, depending on uh, your 141 instructor. Oh, okay. Have you seen limits before? Yeah, um, I do remember. I do remember like um, finding if it was like continuous or not, but oh, I don't. I don't particularly remember if we incorporated limits into the instruction. Got it, got it, okay. All right, and uh, the function visually looks continuous if it has no gaps in the X value. All right, so maybe we'll just say if something is continuous, that means there are no gaps in the X value. Um, so if the function has a hole, 
it is just discontinuous at that point or in general? Fabulous question, Abby. So if the function has a whole, then we say that it's discontinuous at that point, but all the places where there are no holes, then it's continuous there, okay? So that is the perfect nuance that you caught on to, exactly, okay? So, yay. All right, uh, now I know there was a question earlier. Let me go back and find it. Um, in question 12, if function three was continuous, let's see, function three. Ah, okay. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, how to do it with a piecewise function, all right? So that might be a good question to put down for ourselves. Uh, how to find continuity for piecewise functions. Okay. Uh, any other questions that folks came across as they were going through that Desmos activity yesterday? If a function is not defined, it is always continuous. Mm. I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Would you mind rephrasing that for me? When asked to make a function, would a line be a function or two lines be a function? Oh, are you talking about like the sketching ones, Vincent? Ah, okay. So this is sort of, I think something where like when we get to this, this new level of math, sometimes there's more than one right answer. And that's just something that we have to be comfortable with. So let's maybe take a look at slide 10. So if we were to look at number 10 on Desmos activity, I think it says something, sketch a, or actually maybe nine would be better. Number nine on the Desmos activity said, sketch a function approaching two different points as X approaches negative four. And so you can kind of make that up, all right? And if we go ahead, whoa, all right. Thank goodness for the correction methods on, <laughs> Notability, but if we were to sketch a function, I think we all know that x equals negative four somewhere over here. And if it wants us to approach two different points, one possible answer might be something like this, where I could say from the left, it approaches this value, whatever it is, and from the right, sort of does something like that. That would be one possible answer, okay? You could get fancier with your sketching and you could say, I don't want them to be straight lines, like just horizontal lines, that seems kind of boring. And you could make it maybe something more like this, that would be fine. All right, so that would be like another example of an answer. Uh, you could also move this point down below. That would be fine. So lots of different possibilities. Does that make more sense, Vincent? Okay. All right. I think the catch here is you want to have to pick up your mouse, so to speak, uh, as you're sketching these so that it's different from both sides. All right, well, if, uh, if that comes to you, you let me know and we'll address that. All right, so let's go ahead and move on then. Boop, boop. And here is a definition that we have, okay? Now, I think it's important for us to see sort of 
uh, like a notes version of things, but also a what does the textbook kind of say version because, um, you know, as we sort of move higher and higher in our academic careers, sometimes uh, instructors expect us to read out of textbooks. And I think math textbooks can be really intimidating. So I like to sort of cut and paste from the textbook and we can kind of dissect that language together, okay? So we have this definition, a function f of x is continuous at a point a, if and only if the following three conditions are satisfied. And so I think this lines up really well with the contribution we had earlier. The first thing in our checklist is that f of a is defined, right? f of a is defined. Now, one thing we might want to add to this is that the y value at a exists. That's like another way of saying that. When someone says f of a is defined, that means the y value at a exists, okay? Once we check that off, we have two more things to check. All right, we need to make sure that the limit as x approaches a exists. Now, the way this is written, would you say this is a left-hand limit or a right-hand limit? Ah, no pluses and minuses, so exactly. This is the, we call this the overall limit, meaning from, the left and the right, okay? So the overall limit. And the way we know that, there's no plus or minus sign there. No plus or minus means that from both sides, it has to be approaching the same value, okay? And the last thing on our checklist, we're really saying, that the overall limit equals the y value at a. All right, so the overall limit is equal to the y value at a. Now, if all, th all three of these things are true, we have something that is continuous, all right? However, all three of these things in the pink mean that it's continuous at point A, but a function is discontinuous at point A if one of these things is not true. You don't need all of them to be not true. You just need one of them to not be true, okay? And so we'll talk about that as we look at some pictures and hopefully that'll clarify that definition a little bit. So, Let's look at this picture. We've seen this picture before, but now we're asking a slightly different set of questions, okay? Now I asked you, I think on the first or second day, I said like, what's a weird, ooh, is it lagging? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I think the internet connection is not so great today. Um, okay, let me go back. Thank you so much for letting me know. <laughs> All right, is this the part that we have questions on that I cut out on? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so what I was saying is that a function is continuous at a point when all three of these things are true. However, a function is discontinuous if only one or at least one of these things is not true, okay? So a function is discontinuous if one, oh. At least one of the three conditions is not 
satisfied. Right? So in order to be continuous, you need all three things to be true. But as soon as one of them isn't true, it is not continuous anymore. All right, does that make more sense for folks? Yes, Vincent, that is absolutely correct. All three have to be true in order for it to be continuous. And as long as the, oops, if one is not true, if at least one is not true, then you have something that's discontinuous. Is it still cutting in and out or is it better? I think it's better. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so are we okay to look at the example now? Example number one? Okay, all right, so we've seen this picture before. And on the first day that we looked at this picture, I said, what are some X values that are kind of weird? And you folks said that zero was kind of weird. And two was kind of weird. And so, yes, that's what we're gonna do right now. Okay, so let's take a look at x equals zero as a weird point and maybe bring some language around that about removable and just jump discontinuity, okay? So right now we're gonna focus on x equals zero, okay? So what happens at x equals zero? And we're going to break that up into a few different questions. So first question, f of 0 equals 0, OK? Or f of 0, what does that equal? And so we can see from our graph that the y value of this point is 3, OK? Meaning when x equals 0, y equals 3. That's what we're really asking ourselves. Okay. Now, what about part B? What is the limit as x approaches 0 for this particular function? Uh, it does not exist. Ah, OK. So let's go ahead and write D and E for our does not exist. But I'm wondering if you can, uh, maybe someone can explain why it does not exist. Uh, the limit as uh, it approaches x left hand side, to the right hand side is different. Ah, the overall limit does not exist because the right hand limit, okay, so RHL, right hand limit, does not equal the LHL or the left hand limit, okay? So the overall limit does not exist because the right hand limit does not equal the left hand limit. Right. Um, are you not supposed to put like what it's approaching instead? As in, are you not supposed to just put one, but it's not technically hitting one? Ah, okay. So when there's no, um, 
when there's no actual direction on here, oh, it's so you're saying going like online. from the left, it gets to one. So if I said, what's the limit from the left and you said one, you would be correct. And then if I asked you, what's the limit from the right and you said three, you would be correct. But since one is not the same as three, we say that the overall limit does not exist. Okay. So in order for the overall limit to exist, both sides have to get close to the same value. Um, so for part C, it says does f of zero or part A equal the limit as X approaches zero. And I think we can see from our answers that three, which we got from part A is not the same as does not exist. Okay. So what we can say here is that uh, no, F of zero does not equal the limit since three, does not equal, does not exist. Okay. So this, these three questions, A, B, and C, are actually our checklist from above. Is F of A defined? Does that limit exist? And are they the same? Okay. Shoot, I'm sorry. Okay, so part C, all right, part C, if you look at part A, we got three as an answer. In part B, we got does not exist. And so the question in part C is really does part A and part B, do our answers match? Okay, do our answers from part A and B equal the same number? All right, that's really what we're asking in part C. Now, in order for something to be continuous, we need to make sure that all three of those things on the checklist are true. And if at least one of those is not true, we're out of luck. It is discontinuous at that point. And so in this case, is f of x continuous at a or x equals zero? I think our answer will be, oh, no, because f of zero does not equal the limit as x approaches zero of f of x. Okay. Now, another way that we can think about this question, okay? Another way we can think about this question. Here's my picture. Can I draw the function without picking up my pen or pencil or stylus? And I think our answer would be no, because if I draw this side, I trace it all the way to here, I have to pick up my pen or pencil or writing instrument and then start again up here, okay? And so the moment I have to pick up my writing instrument, that point is discontinuous, okay? Since we have to pick up our writing instrument, to draw the function, it is not continuous at x equals zero. Okay, so visually we're thinking 
if we have to pick up our writing instrument to draw the function, it is not continuous at x equals zero. What if the second function is uh, continuous at one, but there is going to be a hole? So from the left side, the function goes right and mm -hmm. it's continuous on the right, but there is a hole. It's still continuous or it is continuous? It's continuous here. That is a great question. So this green piece, that's all continuous. Is it continuous here? No. No, that is excellent. All right, that is not continuous at x equals two. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, now, we sort of have a name for this, all right? I draw this function. I have to not just pick up my writing instrument, but I have to jump to the next y value. We call that a jump discontinuity, okay? So this right here is a jump discontinuity, all right? So when you skip a few y values, that is a jump discontinuity, all right? And so I think one of your quiz questions says, find a place where there's a jump discontinuity. You get to pick the one from the picture, okay? Some of those might have more than one answer, but I think the jump discontinuity only has one answer. All right. All right. How are we feeling on this particular example? I know that the internet is not great. So if you need me to I repeat anything. Question. Yes, go ahead. Um, so in general, they're saying, um, if they ask if something is continuous, they're not, it's not asking like in general overall, it's ask, asking at a specific value, correct? Because like that function that we're looking at, I mean, if you look at it, it's not continuous, but the questions are asking at a specific value, so they could it could be considered continuous? At that point, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think in the chat, we have a question that's very similar. Can a function be only be continuous if every single point is continuous? That is a great way to frame it. So if you basically look at a graph and there's no weird points, everything connects to each other, then it's continuous. So most of the functions we've ever seen in our math careers are continuous. But now we're just looking at some weirder ones where we have those discontinuities in there. All right, let's take a look at some more pictures, all right? So a little bit less uh, scaffolded, but let's think about how we can use some of the language there. All right, so here's a different picture, one that we haven't seen before. And my question here is in this graph of g of x, is g of x continuous at x equals negative one? All right, so when you look at this picture, and you say at x equals negative one, do you think that function is continuous there? No, all right, excellent, excellent. I love these gut instincts, okay? And so let's see what happens. Um, I would agree that g of x is, g of x is not continuous at x equals negative one, okay? Now, the way I want you to explain it though, all right, and the way I want you to explain it, I want you to go through that checklist. And I want you to tell me which one of those is not satisfied, okay? So we have a few possible reasons here. One answer might be that g of x is not continuous at x equals negative one, since uh, g of negative one is on 
to find. Yes, exactly, exactly. There's no value, there's no y value at x equals negative one, exactly, Sophia. So since it's undefined, we actually don't really need to go through the rest of the checklist because we found one thing that is not true, okay? Another thing we might say though is, and so in addition, uh, let's write this out, the limit as x approaches negative one from the left, so that little minus sign means the left, of g of x does not equal the limit as x approaches negative one from the right of g of x. Okay. So I'm intentionally using a lot of the notation that we've been learning over the last few days because I think our contributions are great and I want to make sure we know how to read and write in a way that is uh, making sense for anyone who's taking a calculus class, okay? Um, what is the right-hand limit as x approaches negative one? A two. Yeah, it is two, okay? So maybe we make a note for ourselves that this is actually two. Uh, what is the left-hand limit as x approaches negative one from the left? Like now we're coming from the other side. It doesn't exist because it's approaching an infinite value. Mm, okay, so I would say there's almost two uh, possible answers here, and it seems like we've got them both here. Some schools of thought say that the limit on the left does not exist and other schools of thought say that it goes to positive infinity, okay? Um, it depends on who you talk to. Some people are sort of pickier about some things than others. I will accept both answers, okay? So when we are going following this on the left, we can see that it goes up to positive infinity, okay? So positive infinity is a, a valid answer. Other people, though, say positive infinity is not a number, so we're going to call that does not exist, all right? Um, that's a good question. I know it sounds silly, but I'm not sure that I've reached a sort of consensus about that yet. I think it is probably the positive infinity, but I am genuinely okay with both answers. Uh, anyone in here planning to be a math major? Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, so I think I tend to go with positive infinity. All right, nice, math and psychology. Okay, so math majors, there is a class called Advanced Calculus or at other places, sometimes it's called, what is it called? Uh, intro to analysis. And in that class, you learn a lot more about how we know the things that we are learning right now. Okay, so that's just a, well, food for thought in case you are thinking about being a math major, one of the courses you will have to take is an advanced calculus or an intro to, cal intro to analysis class. And you talk a lot more deeply about like what a limit actually means and uh, whether it exists or it doesn't exist, okay? All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> depends on the school, depends on the major. Um, okay, so is g of x, let's take a look at part b, is g of x continuous at x equals 2 from our picture? What do we think? Yes. Yes, right? Because if I look at this picture and I want to draw like this whole part over here, I don't have to pick up my stylus at all. And so what that means visually is when I look at x equals 2, it is going to be continuous, OK? But let's use our checklist and make sure we know how to say each one of those is true. So g of x is continuous at x equals 2. Since and we'll kind of go through those one at a time. Uh, what is g of 2? Someone tell me what g of 2 is according to the graph. Approximately 1. Yeah, it looks like it's about 1, right? Close enough. Well, let's maybe mark that up. Maybe about 1. All right, so we have that value. What about the limit as x approaches 2 from both sides of this function? What y value does it get close to from both sides of the function? Well, yeah. one. Perfect. It also gets close to 1. OK. Well, the third thing on our checklist g of 2 equals 1, which also equals that limit. And since all three things are true, it is continuous. OK? All right. So let's do this. Let's take a break here. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. All right, folks, I hope you had a great break. I hope that the Wi-Fi is a little better for the second half of class. So thank you for being patient. Thank you for letting me know when things are lagging. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick on the recording. We'll go ahead and start where we left off. All right. So before the break, we were taking a look at uh, some pictures and now and trying to figure out, is it continuous? Is it not? And now we're starting to bridge that gap. We're taking a look at a question where there's no picture provided, but we are going to use that picture. So we're going to use technology to find a picture and then figure out how would we know if we didn't have the picture? In other words, how could we find out algebraically what the discontinuities are like? All right. And so in this case, we're going to take a look at the function x squared minus 3x minus 10 over x squared plus 2x. Now, if you have, uh, if you are on a computer, if you want to go ahead and go to Desmos, not our class, but you can just go to desmos.com. You can type this in. I think it's always good practice to do that. Um, so I would go ahead and type it in and see what that graph looks like. And as you're doing that, I'm just going to finish setting up my grid here. Okay. And I'm also going to switch the screens that I'm sharing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my Desmo screen so that you can see what that picture looks like and that it hopefully looks like the one that you're getting on yours. So let's stop this share. Let's share this one. All right. Are we able to see the graph on Desmos on my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. All right. So we've got here sort of looks like a uh, 
function that we saw yesterday where there's sort of like two different branches here. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I said in the notes is I said, determine the location of the two discontinuities. And so that might require you to kind of click around on the graph and see where you find a place where it says undefined, all right? I think one of them we can see right away from the picture, but the other one we have to sort of look for a little bit more. Uh, anyone have any guesses as to the location of one of the discontinuities? And uh, X equals zero. Y equals, y equals one. Ah, can you give me an X value? X equals zero. X equals zero. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we have a discontinuity at X equals three, or sorry, X equals zero. Uh, yes, all right. So Brittany, that is secretly a way to find discontinuity, all right? So when we're looking and we see an asymptote, when we were in pre-calculus, we just knew that it was an asymptote. Now we're saying that is actually a discon discontinuity within our function, okay? Uh, and I see someone else has said x equals negative two. So let me go ahead and click on my here so we can see all of these have y value, all has a y value, has a y value, has a y value. Oh, excellent, great job x equals negative two. When I click on that, it's actually undefined. And so when I sketch my graph, I want to include that little hole in the function, okay? So let me write this down and then I'll reshare my screen. All right. Now we do wanna be careful about when we say asymptotes, okay? There's in particular one kind of asymptote that is going to lead us to the discontinuity. The vertical kind, great, great, great. Okay, so let me go ahead and sort of sketch this out. The graph looks something like uh, this. And then something like this. All right, that's not too bad for a Wednesday morning. Um, can you tell me more about what you mean by the x's are five and negative two, Vincent? Oh, okay, okay. I love that. Uh, let's, let me pause on that for a moment. Let's finish our graph. And then we're going to actually do exactly what you're talking about on the right hand side. And I think we'll answer your question. there. Okay. So we have this graph, we looked at it, there was a vertical asymptote here. All right. And we knew the location of that asymptote was x equals zero. And this in particular is called a, an infinite discontinuity, all right? It is an infinite discontinuity because when we look at the limits from the left and the right, they are completely different. In fact, they both, go to infinity or negative infinity, okay? So when we see a vertical asymptote, to us, we're gonna now connect that with the language of infinite discontinuity, okay? Now the other discontinuity that we found was x equals negative two, because when we got to the picture, there was 
a hole there. It said undefined, all right? Now, if we look at our graph though, and we were to go to x equals five, I think that's actually right here. If we click on that on the graph, it does not come up as undefined, okay? So from the graph, we have the yellow discontinuity, which is an infinite discontinuity. And we have the pink discontinuity, which we're gonna call a removable discontinuity, okay? And a removable discontinuity just means that it was a point, just one point that everything else around it stayed the same, but we took that one point, tossed it away. We're like, we don't need this point, we're all good, okay? We didn't change anything else about the graph, but we took one point out and that's it. So that's called a removable discontinuity. All right, so you also, I think at some point in pre-calculus, learn some rules. You were like, I don't know, I probably have to do some factoring and then set some things equal to zero, but I might not know what I have to set equal to zero. And so that is something that we wanna really clarify here about how we get discontinuities using algebra, okay? So I think it is good practice in general to factor, right? So we see some quadratics here. Let's take our original function. And if I factor <clears throat> the numerator, I'm gonna find that I have x minus five and x plus two. And when I factor the denominator, I get x and x plus two. All right. So I've got these two factoring pieces. Now, before we reduce anything, before we start canceling some things out, how could we have gotten x equals zero from the equation over here? Like, how would I have gotten that there is a vertical asymptote at x equals zero based on just the equation? Uh, you can set the denominator equal to uh, the asymptote. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go from the denominator, right? This piece right here, x equals, or just the x rather, if I set x equal to zero, well, that turns out to be our vertical asymptote. Uh, also known as our infinite discontinuity, All right? So that X in the denominator gives us our infinite discontinuity, okay? But how could I have found the second one? our x equals negative two, because that one is a little bit sneakier. Like I didn't see that on the graph until I sort of dragged my cursor along and found that undefined spot. How could I have told from the equation? Ah, yes, okay. So yes, both of those. There's the same factor on the top and the bottom, right? So maybe this sounds familiar from pre-calculus. If there is a factor that is in the numerator and the denominator, in other words, the one that we would reduce, that gives us our whole, okay? And so at x plus two equals zero, if we solve that, we get x equals negative two. This gives us our whole, or we call that our removable discontinuity. Okay. Would we would we use the quadratic formula to find where that hole specifically is? Or is that something I remember that's different? Um, where would you use the quadratic formula? 
Um, I don't know. I just remember in some of my old algebra classes, we uh, use the quadratic formula to find where the hole is. I don't ah. know if that applies here. Um, I think this is sort of the moment where we you, we let go of that quadratic formula and we replace it with that idea of factoring. Um, so most of the questions, I'm pretty much all the questions that I will give you are factorable. So we won't really see any weird decimal. Uh, there'll be things that sort of factor nicely like this. Got it, okay. Okay, uh, so let's see, Vincent, is the negative two that is discontinuous coming from the numerator or the denominator? So Vincent, it is actually the fact that it's in both of them that gives us the whole. All right, so if you, you're looking at factors and you see that same factor in the top and bottom, that's the whole, okay? But if you see it only in the bottom, that is your vertical asymptote, right? Uh, Catherine, do you always set that equal to zero or only in this problem? Because that is the specific discontinuity for the function. Great question. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a uh, calculator and if you type in like five divided by zero or any number you want divided by zero, your calculator will give you an error message. And so what we're, that error message means you either have a whole or a vertical asymptote. And so what we're trying to say is, how do we know where those are? Well, what makes the denominator zero? That's really what we're focused on. What makes the denominator zero? So we are specifically setting them both equal to zero because that, that's what makes the denominator zero. Does that answer your question, Catherine? Okay. All right, how do we feel about example number three? Using a graph to kind of see where they are and then confirming algebraically how we found those. It's all about the denominator, okay? Yes, absolutely. So the factor that is only in the bottom our x, that corresponds to our vertical asymptote, right? So anytime you have a factor that's only in the bottom, that's gonna be a vertical asymptote. Separately, anytime you see a factor in both the top and bottom, that's going to be a whole. Hi, folks. Sorry. Where did I cut off? <laughs> Oh, excellent. <laughs> yeah, I will hold on. Set denominator. If, the, if a factor is only in the denominator, then setting that equal to zero will give you the vertical asymptote. And it's possible to have more than one vertical asymptote. 
separately, if a factor is in both the numerator and denominator. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if a factor is in both the numerator and the denominator, then setting that equal to zero will give you the function. Excuse me? Yes. Um, someone mentioned that um, uh, it kicked some of us out, so I don't know if you want to wait until everyone joins back. I see, uh, I see I the know, same number. Yeah, I see the same number of folks back in now as there were before. Oh, okay. Maybe okay. it's just, maybe it's just. Got it. Well, this is a fun technology morning, isn't it? <laughs> uh. Yeah. All right, was everyone able to see that in the chat about the factors in the numerator or factors in the denominator? Yes, okay. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, answer one last question about uh, this particular graph, okay? Um, this is all recorded, so uh, hopefully it'll, it'll still come through at the end. All right, so the last thing I want us to consider with this question is, are the discontinuities fixable, okay? And so what do I mean by fixable? I mean that I can patch it up. I can make it continuous. So in looking at the picture that we have, is it possible to make the function continuous at either the yellow asymptote or the pink removable discontinuity? Um, like, can I make it so that I can now draw that without picking up my pen or pencil? Um, for the pink one. Yeah, yes, exactly. You could get rid of the hole. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so if we zoom in on our picture, if I literally just filled in this hole, then I could draw this whole piece without picking up my pen or pencil. So that one is fixable. What do we think about this asymptote? Can I fix that? Can I make the part on the left and the part on the right connect to each other? It only if you could remove x from the denominator. Yeah, only if I got rid of x in the denominator, right? So then I would be changing the function. And so Vincent, you are correct that no, we cannot. Yeah, exactly. We might all be lagging, but we're having a good conversation here. This is good. Okay. Um, now, if I wanted to, I've had some students in the past say, well, what if I did this and then just drew it down like that and then that, like I didn't pick up my pen or pencil, kind of looks like an EKG reading, but is this okay? No, because think... the function is undefined at the F. Exactly, exactly. In fact, I don't know if you remember learning about the vertical line test to see if something is a function. This whole part, if I connected it and made it part of the function, would violate that vertical line test. 
Okay. And so the moral of this uh, question is that some things are fixable or patchable and some things are not. Okay. So let's write here that uh, the whole at x equals negative two is fixable if we let x equal oh, y equal hmm, what value what y value would we want to give that and i think i saw someone say earlier like what if we reduced it so what if we reduce that if we reduce that and we plug in negative two like we were finding a limit, that would give us the y value that would fix it all, okay? So we're gonna take negative two and we're gonna plug it into the unreduced part of the function, x minus five over x. Negative two minus five over negative two, and we'll get negative seven over negative two. Yes, all right. So if we say, here's a Band-Aid, and I'd like you to put the Band-Aid at exactly seven halves in the Y value, that Band-Aid will cover the hole and make it continuous. Yes, exactly. So this is one application of limits. Limits tell us how we could fix a certain discontinuity if we wanted to, okay? So yesterday when we were like, let's reduce and then plug in a number and we get this number, that's really also telling us not just what the limit is, but how we could fix that particular discontinuity, okay? So great connection there. Now the other one, the infinite discontinuity is not fixable. All right, the infinite discontinuity is not fixable because as we said earlier, that would make it not a function. Okay. All right, I know that was a particularly bad moment in our uh, technology. What other questions might we have? Are all removable holes fixable? Yes, they are. If it is removable, you can fix it by finding the appropriate Y value that would be there, put it in there, continuous. Ah, there are not. There are a couple more that we'll talk about, but these are two of the more common ones, okay? All right. Let's take a look at example four, okay? So example three was kind of a bridge where we still had a picture, and now we have a piecewise function with three pieces, no picture, and we're gonna try and answer this question, okay? So if k of x equals three x minus two, whenever x is less than two, so we've got this piece, okay? And then at x equals two, it is this, and for x greater than two, it becomes a parabola, okay? So even though they don't give us a picture, I bet we could sketch a picture and then use that to help us answer this question, all right? 
So the orange piece of this function, can someone tell me the general shape of that? It is a line, a linear function. Great. Uh, what is the y-intercept of the orange piece? Ah, it's not two thirds. It is negative two. There you go. It's already in y equals mx plus b form for you. Yeah. So we've got a y inter uh, ooh, a y intercept of negative two. What's the slope here? slope is three. And I actually really appreciate the way you write, wrote that, Sherwin. The three is three over one. And because I think sometimes when we're graphing, we forget if there's no rise over run. Like if we don't see the run part, we forget what it is. So I like that you built that in three over one. OK. Um, <clears throat> the green one, what does that look like? Ah, OK, a horizontal line, OK. And what about the blue? Oh, yeah, actually, it's just a point, right? Because it's only for one moment in time. When x equals 2, that y value is going to be 5, OK? Uh, what about that blue part? Parabola. All right, all right. So we've got a line, we've got a point, we have a parabola. So <clears throat> if I were to graph these, right, maybe at x equals two is a good place for us to uh, mark on our grid. Okay. Now, uh, can someone tell me what the how do I want to phrase this? What is the y value of the function as we approach two from the left? Five. All right, I heard someone say five. All right, what is the y value as we approach two from the left. Oh, five and four. Okay, we have competing answers. So let's, let's dive a little bit more deeply. Um, out of the three functions that we have here, which one of these functions tell us about the left hand limit? The orange one. The orange one, okay. And so what we're gonna do here is we can use the orange one to help us find the left hand limit. And so what we can do is plug in two everywhere we see the x and we'll get six minus two or four, okay? Which means that I don't need to sketch the line perfectly. I know that the it's gonna go something like um, this, okay? And in particular, this is a y value of four. Ah, that is an excellent question. Um, there were quite a few folks who said four. I'm wondering how you knew why to, treat, why to plug four or plug two into the orange one? Like why the orange one? We need to look at the graph left of the point x equals two to determine uh, what it's approaching from that side. So we need to look at the uh, equation that defines the graph at x is less than two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's think about like, what's a number to the left of two? Well, I could say one or zero. And so all of those values are going to be defined by the orange one. Okay, because that's when x is less than two. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. So using that reasoning, we can use the blue one to help us figure out the right hand limit, right? Like what y value is it getting close to when we come from the right? So I know piecewise functions are traditionally scary, but it's actually kind of nice to be able to have a piece to pick for the left and a piece to pick for the right. So let's plug in two here. Two squared gives us four. And so if I drew in the blue part, I would have a parabola. It would be like picking up that part of the parabola. Okay. Where do I draw the green point? All right. One above, great way to frame that, Abby. Yep, two comma five, exactly, okay. So now I've drawn this piecewise function. Is it continuous at x equals two? No way, right? No way. So k of x is not continuous at x equals 2. And the reason is since, let's go back to our three things on the checklist. What is k of two? Like exactly at x equals two, what is the y value? Five. Five, okay. k of two is five. The limit as x approaches two of k of x is four. And as Sophia's already put in the chat, the y value when x equals two is not the same as the limit from the right and the left. And so we have k of two is not equal to that limit. And in fact, it is this very last piece that makes it not continuous. Okay, so we failed to show that last one. So therefore, it is not continuing. Exactly. We have a open circle at x equals two because it's less than or greater than, it doesn't have the less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, perfect. All right, so hopefully a little bit of uh, familiarity with working with piecewise function, um, <clears throat> but graphing, making pictures for yourself, um, if pictures are not provided, definitely a very useful skill, I think, in the calculus series. All right, and that should hopefully help with some of the quiz questions as well, okay? All right, so let's summarize a little bit here. <clears throat> so to summarize, here are the three main types of discontinuity. So I forget who asked earlier, but such a great leading question, almost like I asked you to ask that question. Uh, how many types of discontinuities are there? There are mostly, we consider there are three different types, okay? We have a removable discontinuity a jump discontinuity and an infinite discontinuity. And so if we start with the removable discontinuity, we might wanna think about that as a whole in our function. And if you wanna know how you know from limits, well, if you have the limit exists, but it does not equal the y value, then you're gonna have a hole, okay? 
so if the limit exists meaning it approaches the same y value from both sides but it's not the same as the actual y value there then you're going to have a removable discontinuity What about a jump discontinuity? Well, from a picture, we see that we sort of have two different pieces and then there's a gap in the Y values. We jump a few Y values. And so anytime we're jumping Y values, we have a jump discontinuity. So if the left-hand limit exists and the right-hand limit exists, but you know what? they're not the same. And so if they're not the same, that means that the overall limit does not exist, then we've got a jump discontinuity, okay? And finally, if we look at the infinite discontinuity, all right, <clears throat> an infinite discontinuity exists if we have any of the following. Your limit gives you plus or minus infinity from the left, and it gives you plus or minus infinity from the right, all right? Meaning it sort of shoots up into positive infinity or it goes super far down into negative infinity, all right? So anytime you see anything where your answer comes out to be positive or negative infinity, then we're looking at an infinite discontinuity, okay? All right, so I think this is actually a great place to take our second break for today. <clears throat> so we've finished talking about continuity. And then the last piece we're probably going to get to today, which is absolutely fine, is we're going to talk about limits involving trig functions. OK, so when we come back from our break, we will talk about limits involving trig functions. Hopefully, no more tech issues, but you never know. We got to go with the flow. So let's see, it is 8.40 right now, 8.41. Let's be back at 8.51, absolutely right here. Is this good? Okay. All right, I'll see you folks back here in a little bit. Home stretch, exactly, home stretch. All right, so before break, we talked about removable discontinuities, jump discontinuities, and infinite discontinuities. Um, we have a little chart here to help sort of summarize that for you. Uh, but I would definitely make sure you know how to use the chart in connection with some of the problems that we've taken a look at, okay? Now, for this last part of class, we're going to take a look at limits involving trigonometric functions, okay? In particular, we're going to look at two special cases that we tend to see fairly often, okay? And so the first one is f of x equals sine x over x. And when you graph this on Desmos, you get something that kind of looks like this, all right? So <clears throat> similar to a sine function, we see that we have waves, right? So if we think about a sine function, we know that that has waves. But how is this different from a regular sine function? Like, what would you say looks different about the picture? Yeah. <clears throat> when we think about a sine wave, uh, right? the yeah, the amplitude is no longer fixed. Exactly. So if we think about y equals sine x, and I know it's been a while maybe since you've seen that graph, it kind of looks like this, and it's like the same size the whole time, right? Same size the whole time. Um, 
However, in this picture, we can see that the waves get smaller and smaller. In fact, these kind of become very, very, very close to the x-axis, all right? And we sort of see this one point that is higher than all the rest, all right? Now, as I mentioned, Desmos is not obvious about where there might be holes. It is fairly obvious about where there might be vertical discontinuities or infinite discontinuities. Um, looking at the equation, sine x over x, where would you anticipate that there is a hole in this function? X equals zero. You got it. Turns out there is a removable discontinuity. at x equals zero, okay? So it turns out there is a removable discontinuity at x equals zero. And so this graph, even though from sort of far away, it looks like a continuous function, there is one point of discontinuity and that happens at x equals zero, okay? So knowing that, let's answer the following question, okay? Ah, okay. So how did we know that? Well, if we look back on this in particular, what is the one value that would give us an error message if we tried to type it into the calculator? And turns out if we had like divided by zero, exactly. And so that is how we end up with this removable discontinuity there. Okay, this one <clears throat> operates a little differently than the polynomials that we saw earlier, just because we have the sine x on the top. Okay, great question. Um, all right, so let's maybe start with this middle one. What do we think that limit is as we approach zero from both sides on this function? One. Yeah, yeah, very nice. You folks are doing a really excellent job with the visualization piece here. I love it. Okay, so when we come from both sides, we're getting really close to a y value of one. We don't actually get there, but that's okay, right? We still need to acknowledge the fact that we're getting close to a value. Perfect. Okay, now <clears throat> knowing that this amplitude or the size of the wave seems to get smaller and smaller, what do you think the y value is going to be when, and this is a little new for us, when x goes to infinity? Like if I go all the way out as far as I can get, what do you think that y value is going to be? Zero. Yeah, nice they become so flat, so close to the x-axis that they basically have a y value of zero. All right, well, what can we say about if we go all the way to negative infinity? It's gonna be the same, it's gonna get to zero. Perfect, okay. So moral of this story, you need to be really, really careful about what x is approaching. Okay, so if x is approaching zero, we can say that the limit of that function is one. However, if we go out to infinity, we're gonna get zero because the waves get so flat. And if we go out to the other end, negative infinity, we're also gonna get zero. Okay, so it's important to read the little number underneath the limit part um, <clears throat> before we sort of decide what our answer is gonna be, okay? Uh, all right, so let's take a look at some questions, shall we? We've got, <clears throat> for example, five. 
the limit as x approaches zero of sine seven x over x. Now, I know we don't have a picture here and we're actually not going to generate a picture for this particular question. Um, but based off of what you see above, what's your guess? What do you think that limit is going to be when we have sine of seven X over X? Yeah, you are in fact correct. It is seven. Okay, uh, let's play another what if. I don't know if you could see this down here. What do you think about sine, x, sine 7x over 4x? What does our gut tell us that might be? Ah, seven over four, you are correct. All right, now, Abby, you ask a very important question, but how, right? And now we always wanna ask that question. I'm gonna write down these answers right now. We got seven. We got seven fourths, okay? What do we think about uh, example seven? What does our gut tell us that that might be? Ooh, I like this, two guesses. Four fifths or negative four fifths. Okay, all right. And what do we think about eight? That one's a little different, but I'm going to test this shit out. Okay, all right, cool. Well, the neat thing is we can actually use algebra to solve all of these, all right? So let's go back uh, to answer that very important question of, but how though, right? We need to know how and we need to know why. So, well, let's start with uh, <clears throat> example five, okay? So how in the world do we get seven? Right? How do we prove to ourselves that that is in fact true? And so what I'm gonna say is we wanna try and get a situation where, um, what is the coefficient in front of the X here? Like what is the number in front of X in the numerator? One, good. Okay, well, what is the coefficient of X in the denominator? One. One. Okay. Now it turns out that that is actually insanely important. The fact that the coefficients are the same mean that you're going to get a limit of one as you approach zero. So what I mean by that is if I had sine of 2x, sine 2x over 2x, the limit as we approach zero would be one. If I had sine of five X divided by five X, the limit as we approach zero would be one. So it's not just that it's sine X over X, but it's sine of something over that same something, okay? So how could I, what would I need to make the top and bottom coefficients be the same? Like what would be so, so nice to have as a coefficient? Wait, what was the question again, Professor? I don't think I asked that well. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so how could we make the coefficients on the top and bottom be the same? Putting a seven on the bottom? Yeah, if, yeah if we had a seven X on the bottom, 
that would be really nice, right? So let's see. Let's let's do some fancy algebra. Okay. Whoa. So the limit as x approaches zero of sine seven x. And I'm gonna how do we want to do this? What could I multiply by like a fancy way of saying one to make the bottom have a denominator of seven or have a coefficient of seven? The reciprocal. Uh, the reciprocal, if I multiplied those, that would give me one. But as Hamid said here, if I have a seven down here, my denominator now becomes x times seven or 7x, right? But we want to be really careful not to change the question. So just like Vanessa and Sophia said, we want to make the numerator here a 7 as well. Now we have a fancy 1. We're not changing anything, but we end up with the denominator we want to have. And so if we multiply this out, we'll get on the bottom 7x. And this 7 is actually going to be the coefficient of the sine part. So 7 times sine 7x. All right, so this 7 is this 7. And the bottom 7 is that seven. Uh, if the limit didn't approach zero, this wouldn't work. That is absolutely correct. So the fact that we're going to x approaches zero, that's why we're trying to make that denominator be the same as the top. OK. All right. I'm going to take this fraction, and I'm going to split it into seven times seven, sine seven x over seven x. And so just to keep track, this is our bottom seven, and this is that green seven from the numerator, okay? Now it turns out that we can, when we have, uh, a multiplication here, we can sort of break this up into two limits. And so we can actually say the limit as x approaches zero of seven times the limit as x approaches zero of sine seven x over seven x. This, my friends, limit as x approaches zero of sine seven x over seven x. Well, as long as the seven x on the top is the same as the seven x on the bottom, we know that this limit goes to one, okay? That is, if we look back at our picture up here, we're looking at what happens when we get close to that high point there. What about this? What happens when we plug in zero for x? What do we get here for the green part? That's just the limit, right? Like that's just the statement. It is the limit of x approaches zero from either side. The limit is seven. Yeah, this is asking us 
to plug in zero everywhere we see an X. But do we see any Xs there? It's just seven. So it turns out that we end up with seven times one, which gives us seven, which is what we thought might be the case when we started. Okay. Let's try example six. Okay, I think it, it feels a little bit easier once we've seen one and then we try a different one. Okay, so let's see how we can confirm our answer of seven points for example six. All right. This four is kind of annoying. I don't really want a four there. What would I like to have instead of a four? A seven, right? If it was a seven, then I could get all the way to this and know that that goes to one. That would make my life easier, okay? Now, there's sort of two ways to do this, all right? Making four into seven is a little bit harder than making one into seven. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to go ahead and multiply by seven over seven. Mm, okay. We could do everything into a 28. That is another way to absolutely do this. There's a lot of ways to kind of make the number you want, but let's try this seven over seven and see what happens, okay? Let's keep track of where our sevens go. And let's see. So the limit as X approaches zero. Now, I could do seven fourths divided by seven fourths. That is absolutely another way to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the green seven to the front again. So that's my green seven over. Uh, what's four times eight? Four times eight is 32. Okay, what's four times seven? 28. 28. Okay, what's seven times four? Still 28. Still 28. Okay. When we multiply, does the order matter? No. No. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this purple seven and I'm going to make it the coefficient of the four. And I'm going to keep the four out here and then times seven x. So instead of four X times seven, I have four times seven X because when we multiply the order doesn't matter. Just like above, I can split my fraction. But this time I'm gonna have seven over four times the limit as x approaches zero of sine seven x over seven x. This limit goes to one and the seven fourths goes to seven fourths. And so we'll have seven fourths times one for our prediction of seven four. Now that is one way to do it. I really like Sophia's suggestion of doing, instead of seven over seven, doing seven fourths over seven fourths. That is absolutely going to work and get you the same answer of seven fourths, okay? So lots of different ways to get there but we usually want to try and pick something that is going to be fairly streamlined uh, to get us there as quickly as possible.
Okay. Let me pause here for a moment. How are we feeling on example five and example six? Better now, okay, okay. Now I think you're gonna find that that's very similar to question seven on the quiz, all right? So if you were stuck on number seven, hopefully that helps out. And let's go ahead and do example seven and hopefully example eight uh, before we call this a day, okay? So uh, with example seven, we have to uh, think about how we can create um, the coefficients we want. And so in this case, I know I have the 4x on the top and the sine 5x on the bottom. But the good news is, as long as the coefficient on the top and bottom are the same, we're still gonna be able to use that limit as uh, x approaches zero equals one. And so I wonder this time if maybe we could use what, uh, I think it was uh, Sophia suggested, um, doing some sort of fraction situation. So how could I make four into five? Like how do I, what do I multiply by to get four to be five? Okay, five fourths, five fourths. Okay, so I'm gonna put a five fourths up here and a five fourths up down here. And so we have the limit as x approaches zero. And so when we multiply this, 4x times five over four, we're gonna get 5x. And on the bottom, we'll have 5 fourths sine 5x, all right? I'm gonna split my limit. I'm gonna write it as one over five fourths, but you'll help me change that in just a little bit. All right, the second one, five X over sine five X, that's gonna to go to one. What is, what is this though? One over five fourths. Well, it's one over one times four over five. Yeah, so yeah. Exactly. We've got four fifths times one, which gives us four fifths. All right. So I know we asked, I asked you to make predictions before we knew much of anything. I love that some people thought maybe four fifths. I also love that some people thought negative four fifths. Right, because we knew there was like something we have to do to compensate for sort of the reciprocal nature of it. Because I think that negative sign is a really good guess. Okay, it didn't happen to be correct in this case, but in another case, that might actually be the way that it works out. Okay. All right, I think we got time for one more example here. Um, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do with that last section. All right, so example eight over here looks a little bit more complicated, um, but what we're gonna do is use a little bit of algebra and some factoring, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write this limit as x approaches zero, and I'm gonna have sine three x over, and in the denominator, I'm gonna factor. I can take out an x, and I'll have 5x squared minus four, okay? Now, I notice that I have this x down here, but up here, I have a 3x. And so I'm thinking, well, gosh, my life would be so much easier if on the bottom, instead of an x, it was a 3x, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is, write this part so I can focus on that. Think about what I would multiply. 
So 3 over 3. And then I'm going to write this part at the end. 1 over 5x squared minus 4. OK? So because I'm multiplying, I can split things up like this. And in the middle, I can, whoops, I can say, here's the thing that looks so similar to the other question that will give me the coefficient I want. And so we get limit as x approaches 0 of 3 times sine 3x over 3x times 1 over 5x squared minus 4. Now I can take this and break it up into three different limits, OK? One for the 3, one for this one, one for our final fraction. All right, what is the limit of the first limit? The limit of x approaches 0 of 3. That's going to be 3. Good. All right, what about that second one? 1. Good. All right, what about the last one? Oh, so close, so close. Yeah. What method did you use to get negative one fourth on this last one? Um, I just plugged in zero for x. Oh, our good old friend substitution. It's been a, it's been a minute since we've seen substitution, right? We've been making things thinking about all these ways to handle these problems and we're not sure about, but I wasn't joking when I was like, the first thing you should try is substitution, right? So we're plugging zero, we simplify, we're gonna get a negative one fourth. And so we have three times one times negative one fourth, which we can write as negative three fourth, okay? All right, so we are, we've got about like two minutes left. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. This section right here, the sine x over x, that one comes up a lot. It's gonna come up a lot in Calc 1, or not a lot in Calc 1, but it will come up again in Calc 2 again. So this is like a one that definitely is a really common one, okay? There is a second one sort of, limits with trig um, that is a little bit less common, but that we can still uh, use. Um, I will leave this as sort of like extra material. If you want to try and fill this part out, you are more than welcome to give it a go. Uh, but this will not be on an exam. And it's OK that we're not covering this particular topic. OK, most uh, most of the time we just do the sine x over x. Occasionally, if we have time, we'll cover this one, too. Uh, but I don't think that's working out in our favor today. And that's OK. All right. So this last page here is not going to be on the exam. It's not on the quiz. So I think we're good in terms of that. All right. So it is 924. I'll give you an extra minute back in your day and uh, I will see you folks tomorrow. And yes, you should be able to complete the quiz using what you know from today, okay? Uh, I will be on Discord later in case folks have any questions. So definitely feel free to reach out, okay? All right, folks, be well.